Hey Anne, how are you doing? Hi Vanessa, how are you? I'm good, thank you. Welcome. Thank you. I'm so honoured to be here again. How exciting is it to spend a Saturday? Uh, Saturday. See, oh. I'm a, wouldn't even know. Jumping into the weekend Saturday. already. You're jumping already there. But how exciting is it to spend a Friday afternoon and seeing out this uh, challenging week on a bit of a high note of the yes. whole sensory and flavour and taste and... Let's, let, we, we should have a bit of fun. And, and I've got to say, any, everyone that's joining, this is a fun session. Uh, it's something a little bit different. And uh, it's, you know, if you've got questions afterwards, please, you know, drop us a note down the bottom. I'll try and answer as many as I can for you. But I also have to commend you, Vanessa, on such a great series. You've had, uh, you know, five great um, sessions over the last two weeks. And uh, they've been in thrilling to watch. And, and those that aren't watching them, get on. You get to learn differences of chefs and just different backgrounds and different food types. And you trying to say some really big words. <laughs> I thought, because I'm so challenged when it comes to accents and understanding words <laughs> that people say that, you know, different, just different words. And I just... They're like tongue twisters to me, so... Don't worry, I'm in the same boat as you, but we've got some big words today and we'll get <laughs> we'll broken down for you. <laughs> Can you just be nice? Just be I'll nice. I'll be nice, I'll and, be nice. And I'm not the only person that struggles with these types of words, but it used to be really funny. I mean, it's taken me probably three years no. just to say Mexico properly, like... <laughs> <laughs> let alone... But, You've got a lot of new viewers today too that haven't watched the series. So uh, this is all about fun. This is about, we can go any direction. It could be uh, very much a live moment. So this is filmed live. We have no script. No script. It is purely just take it as, take it, as it comes. Yeah. And, and you're going to probably interject with questions from people. It's all good. So a couple of things we're going to do today too, Ness. Um, if everyone at home that has got their little tray of goodies, I'm trying to tilt it without spilling it. There's a couple of things on there that you may not have. That's okay. Um, if you've got some of the ingredients, awesome. Just do the, the, um, the experiment as we go through. Um, did you want to start, Ness? Or I'm just kind of going. Not really, to be honest. I just want you to talk to me about sensory because... I think that when it comes to sensory and different flavors and profiles and tastes, you know, what, what defines them? What, what are they? Yeah, well, let, let's start from the very basic. Um, this is an, an art form that every chef or foodie should be really going after. We really should be uh, touching things, smelling things, getting to know flavors, really appreciating what's on the plate. And um, we're going to do a couple of different things today. And I wanted to say, you know, really good flavor pairing is one of the a chef's best toolkit. Don't worry about sharp knives. This is the most basic. We don't teach it enough. Um, I see a master chef lots of times, you know, master chef contestants, and they're guessing competitions or they're trying to guess a flavor. And they do the biggest mistake ever. They don't pick something up. And I've got a tomato here, and I've got the nice vine, part of the nightshade you family. That we needed a tomato. No, no, no. This is part of my talk. <laughs> so we forget to smell things. And it's interesting. Some of my most fondest memories as a young kid, my grandmother used to grow her vegetables uh, in tomatoes and, and strawberries and all sorts of stuff. And you pick them up and you smell them. Now, first of all, this is a tomato on the vine, nightshade. You take the green bit off and smell it. Now, that, that, those aromas do so many things. And, and all the things that we do in smell. So, for example, you may walk in the street and you can smell someone's got a beautiful perfume and it reminds you of your mum for some reason. Because we've got a lot of, <coughs> pardon me, a lot of memories on flavours and smells. And good flavour pairing can actually, especially if you're looking at your menu at the moment and you want to train your staff or your team during this downtime, get behind 
teaching people about flavors. And that means all your stuff, your front of house stuff, your back of house stuff, even your kitchen hands, and start to know when things are ripe. Um, unfortunately, here in Australia, we're not we're not a seasonal country where, you know, all year round we can grow pineapple, strawberries, whatever you want, we can grow them all year round. And strawberries is a great example, and I'll talk about that in a sec. But, you know, start getting fruit and understanding when it's, you know, ripe. You know, at the moment, tomatoes, this is a nice red tomato. I was lucky that I got a red tomato because mainly they've been green because supply demand has been short. Now, green tomatoes, people go, oh, I'm not going to use them. Green tomatoes are fascinating to use. You know, uh, if you go to the deep south in America, uh, especially barbecue country, fried green tomatoes, one of my most favorite um, food memories of the US is fried green tomatoes. And I, if I've got green tomatoes, I love cutting them up and frying them because they've got a different unique flavor. It's almost like a tobacco flavor. What we can be doing right now is good flavor pairing can help you upsell in your restaurant. You can actually train your teams to upsell and get better margins. Uh, you can have more seasonal fruits and vegetables. So do your menu by season. So don't go, oh, I want strawberry. If you went to New Zealand and put strawberries on the menu all year round, you'll be paying for them in the off season, about $32 a punnet. And we don't do that here. Here we complain when a lemon jumps the price because of floods and all that. Understand what's happening in the market and that way you can create a great menu. Also, great food pairing uh, lowers food costs um, and also can give you the, the reason why it gives you lower food costs because you're giving the right food, food pairings. You're not putting too much on the dish. Simplicity can be the best thing. And you can also offer a higher price to um, dishes that are better com um, combinations or paired properly. And how great, and you've been to some wine dinners where the wine has been matched to the food. How fantastic is it? Yeah, and, but sometimes it can be really poorly matched as well. And I oh, think correct. That, that, you know, when you do have different food and it, the wine will taste a certain way, you then eat the food, you have the wine again, and it tastes completely different. Yeah, um, this is this is important, and, and that's why sometimes you go into a restaurant, and when you get beautiful wine matches, wow, you know, the, you, you actually often forget about the food sometimes, because chefs don't always think about the intricacies of the the menu or the dish, or why they did it. They just put some flavors. Unfortunately, big marketing companies or big food companies put all these flavors together. They put it in consumer research, and customers go, "Oh yes." That sounds awesome, but they actually don't work to each other. And I see that often as a product developer, so many products in the market just go, why did you put that flavor with that? Because it sounded good. And sometimes that's what we've got to stop. So let's talk about our senses. We use our five senses. So first of all, I'm touching this tomato. I'm, I'm seeing if it's ripe. We do a lot by, by touch. We will pick stuff up. It's annoying when someone picks up an, an apple in the fruit market and you go, why are they touching everything? Sometimes that's the best way of telling if your fruit's ripe or not. If you've got a dish and you're going to use an avocado that's unripe, you know that in four days you're going to be using it. Get the unripe one because the moment you take the avocado home, it's going to ripen even more. So you know touch how I ripen my avocados if they're not ripe? In a paper brown bag. With a tomato. With a tomato or banana. Yeah. Um, be, uh, they, bananas produce a gas, so the tomatoes, because they continue to ripen, and an avocado. But so an avocado. You know, so you know how we said that we just can go all over the place, like we don't yeah. just stick to one thing. It was interesting when you and I were out at the fruit and veg markets with Julia, and we were doing the tour. Yeah. And I just didn't have a clue why the bananas are all kept so separate to everything else. Like they've got their own area. Isn't that fascinating? All of the other produce. A really good supermarket or fruit and veg shop will also do the same. The, the bananas are like way over near the bread section, away from everything else, because they produce a gas that ripens other fruits and vegetables. Yeah, I, th I find that fascinating. I found that fascinating because I actually had always thought that they were over there being gas and they were being gas to become ripe. Like 
You know when you get a banana and it's quite firm on the um, in the inside, but the yeah. outside started to discolor. Yes, and people don't see that, and so that, that actually that brings a great one because we also use our sight, and that is a beautiful red tomato. If we see it green, we don't want it. We see black spots and something, we go, oh no. And actually, black spots on a banana, if you're really smart, I would buy them and you make banana bread, you know, because that's the best time to make banana bread. Yeah. Because you're starting to understand and appreciate what you've got. We've got this beautiful red tomato. It looks fantastic. It looks too shiny, actually. It looks too great. So you pick it up, you, you got it. Next thing, you, you smell it. And there's this really unique tobacco smell to a tomato. And I put the, the, the stem there. And it's got this really nice green, ripe, um, grassy kind of aroma. I love, love, love fresh tomatoes. Do you want me to tell you a very interesting fact that yep. you may not even know? Okay. You know they, did you know that my grandfather had the very first hydroponic tomato um, uh, farm or, or garden? Wow. Actually, yeah, they had. we had the sheds up on the Central Coast and he brought them out from New Zealand. He had the first hydroponic tomato plants in Australia. Oh, wow. That's fascinating. Yeah. We actually want, we're actually now one of the largest countries in the world that produce hydroponics. Um, and hydroponics, those that don't know, was actually invented in Australia. There you, there go. you go. So, uh, what, what was that? What were they invented for? Hydroponics, because, because we like growing things all year round. I don't know. There you go. That's the answer. <laughs> so, we've used our sight, we've used our smell, we've used our touch, hearing. Now, it's really annoying you go to the movie theatres and I'm one that hates people rustling chip packets. But also, you, you hear people eating chips and, they, and they're opening their mouth and it's like, oh my God, I'm going to kill that person. There is a true satisfaction in crunching a chip or hearing something and hearing things for the first time because it actually entices you to really enjoy flavour. The other last one is taste. So that's what we put into our mouth. And I'm going to talk about that in a second. Just watch how you're swinging that knife around. You're going to cut your oh, mouth yeah, off. Oh, yeah, I'm talking with a knife in Italian, you know, going there. Now, the interesting thing is we look at things with um, appearance. So we look at the size, shape, the color. We even look at the texture of products. That's why people don't like, some people don't like eating avocado or custard because it looks runny and it puts them off texture. Um, we're really weird uh, beasts because we'll we'll look at things. We even look at temperature. If it's too cold, you know, you know, and you're going to get um, teeth that you know hurt when you eat it. You go, oh, I'm not going to eat that. Or if it's too hot, what do we do? We blow on it or we wait till it cools. So it's really interesting. We do a lot with that. We also aroma. One of the things, as, as I said back then, Master Chef, you see these contestants. They're trying something for the first time. And they don't smell. And it frustrates the hell out of me. Frustrates me. Because 80% of what we taste is through smell. And, you know, how do you truly say something when when you're not smelling? When you pick it up. Does everyone agree with that online? Does everyone agree with that statement? Let us know. Oh, you're putting it out there. No, but <laughs> uh, this is a true thing. 80% of what we taste is through smell. Uh, our, our palates... Our, our, our throat is connected to our nasal capacity. That's why it is 80% of what you taste is smell. You taste buds and your, your nose breathing in and out. That's why if you have a really minty uh, or me, uh, menthol type product and you have some ice cold water, you can hardly breathe because menthol pr produces a, a gas or a vapor and you're drinking the cold water and you so and you, Oh, wow, I can't breathe. It's really cool when we start to do this. Now, we're still learning about how what we taste years on. We've been doing, the. I don't know if anyone's ever seen it, and I'm going to dispel a rumor right now. If you studied the tongue map at school, where it says sour, sweet, salty, bitter on your map, on your tongue, it's actually wrong. It's been thrown out the books, and unfortunately, it's still taught in schools, even though it's been discredited uh, numerous times by many scientists and in the, only in the last 20 years too um, it's still taught in schools we need to get yeah. rid of that what are people saying online so far um, 
Yeah, you're all wanting to know. Um, Julio said anchovies are hairy little buggers. Yes. See? Alex is saying hello. And, and we had Graham Kruger as well from... Um, oh, all the way up in Dubbo. We've got Anna Jane Dalton who's in lockdown up in the Hunter. Richard hello. Franiski from Melbourne. Carlo is with us again. Wow, Mark Carlo, you got in a record. Some, good to see some some of the uh, comments coming through. It's it's awesome. Hello, everyone. Well, now we're going to we talk about so and what are the five? What what's the difference between taste and flavour, Vanessa? Do you know that? Uh, what's the difference between taste and flavour? No. Flavour. So, taste is uh, refers to the connection of the tongue. Your taste buds in your mouth, and we recognise basic taste. What are the five basic tastes that you would recognise? Sweet, sour, salty, bitter, hot, yep. and umami. Yeah. Okay, so we sweet, salty, bitter, uh, sourness, and umami. Does everyone know what umami is? Hopefully, well, they do. I was actually on um, hot seat yesterday. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay, well, we'll talk about umami. Umami's the fifth taste sense. But what if I tell you there's the sixth taste sense? What would be the sixth taste? You tell us. Okay, so everyone would normally go to chili but or, uh, or spices. Actually, no, that's a heat factor. Um, the, the sixth one, which is just about to really come to light and we'll probably see it in the next few years, is fat or rancidity. Because we can taste rancidity, uh, fermented things, uh, our palate is quite good in, in tune to that. So that is the basic taste. That's what we're tasting. We're doing a tasting. But if we're gonna do the true organoleptic, there's a word for you, Vanessa, organoleptic, organoleptic. which is the <laughs> organoleptic, which is the perceived sensory stimulus using every part of our um our um senses and how we go about and that's what flavor comes here it's a total aspect of taste aromas smells texture that create the flavor so imagine eating a potato crisp that doesn't crunch when you crunch it you're going to think that's soggy correct yeah, or you're going to start to it was boring i like to make noise correct you're going to say it's boring you're going to say it's horrible well taste and flavor is two different things and this is important to know this those that are experienced tasters and if you've got people like anna jane online you know they're she's a professional taster um these are basic things but everyone needs to know this because we're going to start a journey now with taste the tongue can detect five things um and with the fatty being the six we also look at things that um, have heat notes. So we talked about spice. So it could be chili or it could be uh, refreshing. We could also talk about um, uh, things like mint, cooling, um, menthol. It's also cooling. Now, umami is a savory taste. Now I'm holding up a tomato. Tomato is savory. It's umami. And savoriness is the best way of describing umami is that when you bite into something, and those anchovies that Julia doesn't like, really a mommy taste. And it starts to salivate in your mouth. That is true savouriness. And think about all the things that have savoury savory taste. Parmesan cheese, meat, anchovies, um, fish, mushrooms, tomatoes. Fantastic notes of umami. Um, mushrooms have the highest amount. Now, umami was... Well, would, pate, would pate be... Would pate fit into that? Uh, yeah, pate does, so because you've also got, don't forget, you've got garlic, you've got onions. They also produce an umami note. The best umami, oh, also walnuts, I forgot about walnuts. The best umami in the world, and I absolutely hate it, is Vegemite. Vegemite is the best umami. I love Vegemite. How can you hate Vegemite? Oh, I'm so un -Aussie. I'm so un -Aussie. That's so bad. Yeah. I actually love that, Promite and Marmite. Promite and Marmite. Do you, so do you know the story about um, what Vegemite's original name was? So in the, in the 1900s when Vegemite was invented, 
Marmite was already around about a year before Vegemite. And there was a commercial out there that the first name of Vegemite was actually called Par Will. Because if Marmite, Par Will. And that's what the original name of Vegemite was. So Marmite, it was a, a actually that was a great period in Australian history. It was the 1900s when we tried to stop buying American, uh, American and British products into our country. And we started taking on our own identity of things that were made in Australia. And Vegemite is one of those great products that were made in Australia against Marmite, the big ones. Um, and it's really interesting. We could talk about Vegemite all day, but umami was discovered only in the 1900s, 1908. Uh, it was Dr. Kukami uh, Ikada from Tokyo. Uh, he made a stock out of kombu. So seaweed is also great for um, umami. And it's a really amazing product to use. Now, umami also comes from marrying things like sweet and salty together. You get this really nice umami effect. Um, also bitter and sour together. All the umami notes come through. So adding those ingredients in gives you this kind of ultimate flavor. And that's what umami is. Um, before we forget... So, so just to go... So... Yep. Uma, uma. <laughs> umami. 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 Is, I always thought that umami was balance. Well, that's exactly what I said. You right. could have salt, sweet, bitter together to create umami. Yeah. And it is that savouriness, that saliva, when, you're, when you bite into the Vegemite sandwich and your just mouth starts to water, that is the perfect balance. Because what is Vegemite? It's yeast. It's salt. It's got sugar in it. It's got all those balances. Tomato, it's got sweet, salty, sourness. It's also got bitterness because it is part of the nightshade family. Now, what about interesting. Beetroot? Beetroot is beetroot does have some earthy notes, so that can produce um, similar uh, tones to um, uh, mushrooms, like shiitake and all those. We're going to talk about something. So a while ago, I created a beverage. I created a beverage called Love Bite with Fruit Core, and Love Bite was the first food pairing soft drink, non-alcoholic drink, that paired with food. And how I created that was like creating music notes and understanding that different balances happen in there. Now, the interesting thing is, the reason why I come up with that, one of the biggest conditions that in the last 100 years, since its invention, we've been conditioned to drink Coke. One of your favorite things, Vanessa. Well, actually, um, Diet Coke is my favorite. Diet Coke, sorry. Yeah, Coke, Diet Coke, doesn't matter. It's the same stuff. And it could be Pepsi, doesn't matter. Um, and I shouldn't say a brand. We'll just say cola, but any cola, we're conditioned to drink it. And we actually, what do we do? We get lunch. We've got a beautiful salad sandwich. We crack open the Coke. We drink the Coke. And uh, the, salad, the salad sandwich that you paid $9 or $12 for is now soggy. It's not as great as what it should be. You rushed it down, but you finish your Coke or you take your Coke with you and you continue drinking that. You've just done yourself the biggest disservice of all. And it doesn't matter what it is. It could be any other soft drink, but I'm giving cola a, a bit of a wrap, uh, a wrap here. Because when we get a tomato, what should a tomato taste like? What should it taste like, Ness? Sweet. Yeah, sweet, sour, raw, grassy, all these great notes. So I'm going to get some tomato. Mm. It should be fresh. It's salty and sour. It's beautiful. It's unbelievable. Now, when you get the Coke and drink the Coke, your tomato does no longer have any flavor because unfortunately the cola has chemicals in it that block your taste receptors. And that's why um, people that are uh, in sensory always train to eat crackers or still water or sparkling water to cleanse our palate. Because every time we eat things, that three base water is actually got the perfect pH to be able to cleanse your palate. Yeah, talk about that. Talk about that, the, the three phase water. Yeah, What's... so that's a, a water that comes from Adelaide, I believe. And um, it certainly does. And the way that they came across it is just an, a unique story. But they had, um, there was a, a documentary with, um, 
what's the guy that was out of High School Musical? Um, uh, Zach Efron. Zach, yeah, Zach. That's Efron. really sad that I knew that really fast. <laughs> and, yeah, and they, I was like, how do you know that? Um, and they, they were traveling around America, and these this couple that have this three bays water have been trying to take this product to market for a long time, but it's the most pure, beautiful water you can imagine to have. Anyway, Zac Efron tried it on camera and just said about how amazing it was. So overnight, they didn't even realize. And then the next morning, their inbox was just exploded and they were trying to then ship um, container loads of this water over to the US. So you should actually uh, put that in the uh, Dropbox down below and get people to buy that water because it's amazing. Uh, but to my point on that, when you drink the Coke or the cola, you block the taste receptors that tomato. It's not fresh anymore. It doesn't, it tastes dull. And it, you know, it's really un, uh, unsettling to see that it tastes no longer, you know, that great flavor. Same with beetroot, same with everything. So wash your palate out and cleanse your palate. Now, that's why I created that beverage. So I could get something that cleansed the palate while you were drinking it. And uh, every time you taste the next bite, you're getting the flavor effect. Now, we're going to talk, and um, this is probably where the fun starts to be happening. We're going to talk about um, uh, flavor matching, and I'm going to do it with strawberries. And that's why we've asked the viewers at home and uh, everyone else online to get some ingredients and assemble some ingredients. So if you've got a tray or just some little random bowls of you know olive oil, balsamic, honey, salt, uh, cinnamon, we're going to take a journey on flavor matching and why that and, and the reason why i'm doing a strawberry because a strawberry is the most complex uh product to ever rep replicate in flavor do you know why the strawberry has over 382 volatiles that makes up the signature of a strawberry's aroma and flavor wow that makes it the hardest to replicate in a commercial sense. So when when people and we're going to use some nice words here in a second. Um, are they when big people words make? Or are they just words? What was that? They, they're they're nice words? words. They're they're actually sensory words to help describe the flavour and the aroma of what you're experiencing. And a strawberry having 382 volatile compounds, it's actually made of um, things like esters, ketones terpines, furones, uh, adalides, alcohols, sulfur. It's also got methobutanate, uh, linenol. Now we're going very chemistry here. Now I failed science at school, but you know, uh, as I got into food and really got into food science, I started understanding these compounds are exactly what we need to pair food. That makes the humble strawberry the most universal food flavor or flavor matching that we can do of all products really? and we're going to talk about that now the strawberry the humble strawberry originally comes from a latin word its full name was the botanical name is called fragara fragara i don't know how you say it but fragara is probably how i'm going to call it i'm going to own that it's a latin word and the latin word fraga meant fragrant berry and there is no more fragrance than a, uh, a strawberry because you get so many different smells. Now, some of those smells, because it's got those compounds and um, things like uh, sulfur, when I say sulfur, you're going to go, oh, sulfur's terrible. That's burnt egg or you know, overcooked egg. Or when you go to New Zealand and you go to Rotorua and you smell that sulfur because of the, the volcanic mud. It shouldn't be in strawberry, should it? Well, it is in strawberry. And because it's got so many complex, the only other one that's so complex is a banana because it has over 360 flavor volatiles itself. And a strawberry and a banana, when you go to buy lolly bananas or lolly strawberries, they go can be quite sweet or jammy. They can also be, uh, you can have strawberries that are you know, tropical, very floral, fruity. The other words that for a strawberry is uh, grassy, raw, green, um, woody, buttery. Uh, a strawberry can also taste like a mushroom. Um, it could have honey notes, balsamic, caramel. 
it could taste creamy. It could potato notes could be coming from a strawberry because it's that? got the same why volatile. It, why does it take on so many different profiles? Uh, it, this is the thing we're still learning. It's because you've got volatiles. That's what we create so many of our foods What's with. A, and so what is a volatile if you had to break A volatile it? is essentially a compound, a flavour compound that makes up what we're smelling, what we're touching, feeling, all those sort of fun things. This, Don't worry, there's some great books we'll talk about yeah, at like the end. It's like an interaction almost. Yeah, it's, look, the, the compounds that make up each flavour. So, for example, think about a strawberry. How's it growing? It's growing on the ground in a little shrub or little bush kind of thing. I'm not sure it's not a bush. It's kind of like on the ground, a runner is probably a better word. So it's growing close to soil. It's got green, it's got a green top. So it's got chlorophyll in it. It's got all these notes and it's quite close to it. It's a fruit that also ripens very fast. It goes, uh, it can be very sour. It can be fermented. It can also be sweaty. Uh, strawberry also has cheese notes that similar in them. And I said sulfur. Now, when we think about strawberries, season, if we're going to be truly seasonal, Julia is going to kill me for this, but we're all year round. Um, normally the best season for a strawberry is November to February. It's normally in the hotter climate when strawberries grow. Now, interesting. I said Australia is the grower of strawberries all year round. We actually see strawberries all year round. Sometimes they fluctuate a little bit more, but right now, strawberries are coming down in price massively. They're about $2 a punnet. They'll stay like that for a while, unless there's a, a seasonal event, Julio, or some storms or something like that, or someone doing something nasty like putting needles in them. Uh, let's hope that doesn't happen. The interesting thing is between June and October, we actually see the Gold Coast strawberry farmers start to produce their strawberries. So that's why we're getting some really nice cheap ones because the Gold Coast has got some great strawberries, some great, great weather. Then you'll see November to February, we'll start to see the best strawberries. And sometimes they're really big. They're fantastic. And I smell this strawberry now and it's, it's amazing. I'm going to talk about that too. But the seasonal, because of climate, they need warm climate. And a strawberry is not always red. Strawberry can be yellow. There are white strawberries out there. There's even originally in the Middle Eastern, uh, Middle Ages, not Middle Eastern, Middle Ages period, strawberries were black for a long period. Really? Yes. And there's even a rare blue and a rare green strawberry, not green because it's raw, green because it's a, a, an actual wooden uh, a forest berry. And, and, and they're quite okay to eat. Quite okay to eat. I even a green never one. Heard of that. Yeah, there's so many fun things about strawberries that um, that people don't know. But the black strawberry doesn't exist. You can actually buy some really, if you go online, you can buy some funky seeds on eBay, uh, like the blue and the green ones. They do turn out there that way. I don't know how long, but they do turn out there. Be they haven't been touched. They're not GMO. They're not, you know, they're natural, but they're just not growing. We've, we've probably... In the Middle Ages, what happened is we started um, attributing the strawberry, the black strawberry, as the uh, like as poison, and we didn't want it. And what happened was in the Middle Ages, we were coming into the Romantic periods as well. The strawberry was seen in lots of paintings and frescoes, and 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 they you see the red. It's just like the carrot. The the carrot wasn't always orange; it was always black or purple. And uh, the Dutch changed, uh, or the rumor is the Dutch ph of the soil changed it to orange so you know we've changed things over the years and strawberries are the most romantic fruit in the world the most we have them on valentine's day we dip them in chocolate we do all these things and we only think that there's certain things about uh, a strawberry now so strawberries julio has said yes. that he's nodding his head <laughs> um, and then he wrote heirloom varieties. Yes. Graham Kruger said strawberries work well with kangaroo or game meats, so I've found. Thank you, Geraint. Julio Fragola in Italian. Andrew Ballard said the automatically generated subtitles are struggling with these words. Adam, <laughs> Alex Sakari, <laughs> strawberries are amazing. Okay, I'm glad everyone agrees. Let's, let's talk about strawberries. So if you're at home right now and you've got a strawberry, I suggest you get one 
And what are we going to do? We're going to smell it first. So, Vanessa, I want you to smell your strawberry and tell me what you're smelling. Do you know what I actually smell when I smell this? Remember the strawberry patch dolls? Yes. The, the cabbage patch? Right. That because that's actually a, 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 a compound that they used to devise strawberry. So if you were trying to make strawberry, try and get a strawberry lolly. It's like jammy and all fruity, but it's not It's not all these compounds that I've talked about. So smell the, have you got the green bit on top? Oh, little, I cut mine off. Okay. Smell the green bit. Not that you're going to eat the green bit. What are you getting? Not a lot. <laughs> so my strawberry is quite uh, sweet. Um, it's quite jammy. Love jammy like. I love the smell of strawberries. So we're going to cut our strawberry in half. Everyone should know how to do that. And I want you, before you even eat it, open it and smell it. Oh, what can you smell? Oh, it's like a burst of like... So your strawberry is going to be different to mine. We bought them in different shops. Everyone else yeah, well, at home. I've actually got a little grassy note to it. Great. Awesome. So to closer up to the stem... You get some grassy notes. I'm getting a real buttery note with this product. I'm smelling it. It's got buttery and also balsamic notes coming through, which is really interesting. So what we're going to do, I want you to get half your strawberry or those people at home that are going to eat. If you're not eating, just follow along and record, watch the recording later because you can do this at home. I want you to get your strawberry, the half a strawberry, and I want you to close your nose off like so. And chew the strawberry. Let go of your nose. Now, when you block your nose, as I said, you asked the, the audience before, is 80% of what you taste is from smell? When you put your, your strawberry in your mouth, did you taste anything? No. Oh, you, I, with my nose blocked? Yeah. No. It, it, you could actually probably taste some of the more earthy, the, the ground notes, some of the sulfur notes. You probably wouldn't have tasted much more than that. When you open your nasal capacity... It's like the menthol thing that you spoke about before. Correct. And what's happening is the palate of the strawberry is amazing. Now, I've got a quite a jammy note. It's quite overripe. There's a sourness to my strawberry. Uh, it looks beautiful, but there's a sourness... I've got some bitter notes coming in, which is actually okay. People might be experiencing, they might have overripe strawberries. It might be sweeter. It might be, um, you know, quite fruity. It might smell like pineapple. It also might taste like pineapple. Strawberry yeah. and pineapple are very similar. What about if I said it smells like roses? Strawberry and roses are actually uh, a similar family. And strawberries and roses share similar volatiles together to make the complexity. And strawberry and rose, funny enough, is actually a beautiful pairing. If we've got some champagne, some strawberries and some rose petals, it is absolutely beautiful. And that's why it's called the, you know, the strawberries, the, the uh, uh, fruit of love. You're putting it with champagne, you put with rose petals, we're marrying everything together. And that's why we see it on Valentine's day. That's amazing. Now, I actually didn't realize that. So they, yep. they all do resonate with that whole occasion, don't they? Yes. Wow. Um, right now, too, I'm, and I'm also going to get, and I'm going to talk about it, too, before we start tasting. There's three dimensions of flavour. There's the, the first time you try the strawberry, you get the, the, the first thing you taste. It might be the sweetness, the sweetness coming through. Then when you get to the middle, we probably might find that there's other notes coming through. So mine's got this pineapple jammy note coming through. And then the third dimension is the last thing I'm tasting, the what's on my palate. So I'm getting some sweetness, but I'm also getting some green notes coming through, grassy notes. And it, my palate is now in that space. What we're going to talk about now, I'm going to do something. So we did a salt masterclass the other week. And I told you fruit and salt are a great pairing. We're going to, and the viewers at home, what I want you to do is get a, a half a strawberry. If you've tasted it and you know what the strawberry tastes like, what I suggest you do is get some sea salt. It's really bad for the camera, but I'm going to put sea salt on. And I've crushed it on. 
And what I'm going to do is also rub that in. Now, strawberries, what do we do? Uh, if Julio wanted to make a, a nice strawberry consomme, he'd probably put some sugar over it and it will start to break down the, the natural sugars of the strawberry and it has a lot of excess liquid. Same with salt. What we're going to do is take our first bite of strawberry and salt together. What do you think it's going to do, Vanessa? I think the strawberry will eliminate the saltiness. Okay, so yes, what happens is we're putting salt and sweet together and sour. We're actually creating an umami effect with the strawberry now. And what you'll see is this is a perfect match made in heaven. It's no longer sweet, but pleasantly umami as the salt works on a few of the volatiles and partners with those volatiles. So we're gonna bite our strawberry with salt. Everyone take a bite. Now tell me what you're exper experiencing the first up. It actually is a savory. Yeah, correct. So you should uh, first up on the first part of the, the first dimension of flavor, you probably get some saltiness. Yeah. Then I'm getting that umami coming in the middle. It's no longer sweet anymore. And what I'm getting at the end is this really unbelievable savoriness. My mouth is just salivating right now. So those that are home watching this, the strawberry and the salt, perfect combination. Um, because of pineapple, if you go to Thailand, one of the uh, Thailand or Vietnam, Julia, you've been to Vietnam with me. Um, we serve pineapple huh? with chili salt at the end of the, the, the meal because it's a good way of cleansing your palate. The sourness, the heat, the saltiness coming together and you're cleansing your palate. So I've actually, with each dish that we're going to talk about, I've also created, with each combination, I'm going to talk a dish that could possibly go with that. So we could make a strawberry saltwater taffy. So like a lolly. Or almost like a toffee, but a taffy is a little bit more stickier using the salt water and strawberry. Unbelievable. Forget about salted caramel, salted strawberry taffy. So how did you enjoy that one? I like that. So okay. Why? That actually sounds good. I would buy that um, strawberry salty taffy. Yeah, so each pairing, we're going to talk about a different one. Now, on, on this chest, we've got some flavors that work with other things. Some of the unusual flavors that would work re really well with um, strawberry is truffle, for example. Yeah. So truffle mushrooms. Doesn't truffle yeah. work well with anything? Uh, no, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. Well, we actually, we could do that as another session, but truffle and strawberry pair beautifully and actually naturally. So if you imagine you've got some chocolate and truffle and strawberry together, you're creating this ultimate umami kind of effect. What if I said to you, um, alcohol, so we're going to go a whiskey or a Grand Marnier. What would we do with a strawberry? Do you think they marry well? Um, yeah, definitely. Yeah, so if you really want to make one of the most classic desserts in the world, a strawberry Romanoff, which is very old school, um, it's you know using that Grand Marnier, you could put, introduce coffee into it. Um, and you know strawberries as well because they all pair really well and get this great dish going. But what if I said to you mussels? Would you put strawberries with mussels? Traditionally, no. Okay, because we've been taught that way. But one of the best flavour pairings of all time is actually a strawberry and mussels. That's incredible. And, and to tie that together, if you wanted to make it more acceptable, use the white wine. So, for example, you could do some mussels in white wine and some herbs with a strawberry compote on top or even like a pickled strawberry. And these two would be the most unbelievable pairing together. A lot of people don't realise strawberries work so well savoury as well as sweet. We're going to go do a sweet one at the moment. The next pairing I'd like everyone to do, get you know, strawberries, cut them in half, don't have to eat a full one. I'm going to do the vanilla and vanilla essence. So I've got oh, my yeah. little vanilla essence. Yep. So I wanted to go a sweet one. Now, interesting. A very thick vanilla essence. My one? Mine's actually real vanilla essence. It's not fake vanilla essence. It's real one from Helia. 
which is a beautiful Tahitian. Now, I'm just going to put my strawberry in and just let it soak up some vanilla. Now, traditionally, we associate vanilla as sweet. But to get vanilla fermented, we ferment it in alcohol. And alcohol has bitter notes. So vanilla is technically a bitterness. Vanilla complements strawberry. Really? really? Yeah, it's a real bitterness. We add vanilla sugar to it. Bitterness. Yeah. We add sugar to it to make it sweet. If you taste the vanilla essence by itself, you'll get the, the bitterness coming in the back of your throat. And it's from an orchid flower. So that's why it's, it's quite bitter. But what's interesting is if we put these together, vanilla is very floral. Do you know where, the, actually, this is really random. I'm going to give you the, do you know where we first experienced vanilla and MSG in life? You ready for it? Yep. So the very first time we experienced flavor is through mother's breast milk. Oh, Jesus. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I got to talk about it. <laughs> vanilla and MSG is a compounds that make up mother's breast milk. So it's salty, it's sweet, it's bitter, it's floral. And interesting, um, there are people that have studied this. I haven't personally done it, but it has been done. And uh, so it's interesting because you actually have half the population or you have a mix of population. You have people that really love sweet tooth because their mother's breast milk had a bit more vanilla notes in it. Then you have people that like really salty, savory things because their mother's breast milk had more MSG. It depended on what mum made. She ate the salty pickle, then it was going to have more MSG. The other one is, if you get people that don't like both, everyone's probably gasping at that at the moment. And you are there, said, what? Didn't see that coming. <laughs> <laughs> now, and interesting. You know, try being in my position and sitting here with a straight face. <laughs> the, the other one, where you see where people don't like sweet or savoury and they like other things, like bitter and sourness, they were probably um, a bottle feed. So, random. Anyway. We now have a strawberry with vanilla notes. It's been soaking for a while. And this brings out really nice floralness and actually brings a natural sweetness of the strawberry. So I can take so, it out of my vanilla now? Take it out of your vanilla. And uh, remember the taste of your strawberry. And I want everyone to bite the vanilla paste and strawberry to go. Oh, wow. The strawberry has now elevated. It should be sweeter. You also should get a lot more pineapple notes or tropical notes coming because vanilla growing in tropical regions, hot area, it's an orchid. You, you got all those notes coming. So the bitterness and sweetness are highlighting things in there. It's actually really interesting because there's, as I've got older, kiwi fruit, guava, anything with that really high acidic, um, I get a bit of a reaction from yep. and I never used to have it until I was getting, until I was like um, 28. But when I just had that one with the vanilla, I got that same sensation on the, the top of my roof of my mouth. Okay. So you know why? No. So pineapples, <laughs> um, most of those fruits that are high in acidity have enzymes in them that actually, a pineapple is actually designed to eat you. Uh, because it has enzymes that actually break down your palate. So when you start eating pineapple, you start to feel your mouth itchy. You might, you know, might be a little bit of a tangy sens sensation. It's got enzymes that breaks down proteins. And a lot of fruits and tropical fruits like kiwi fruit, guava, yeah, I pawpaw. I that to tenderize the squid, right? Yeah, squid or kangaroo, as uh, Gray mentioned before. Um yeah, so what I did with the, by the way, strawberry and vanilla, great pairing, a strawberry vanilla cheesecake, but like an upside down cheesecake where you had the strawberries soaking the vanilla, kind of a little bit toasted off and cheese because cheese works really well uh, with strawberries. Um, again, because they've got cheese notes and they work well. So strawberry vanilla cheesecake is the ultimate. And that is Sarah Lee's number one selling cheesecake is a strawberry cheesecake because it has those great pairings. It has vanilla notes. It's got really good baked notes in there. Now, we're going to go for a little bit more savory now, a little bit more tanginess. We've got our balsamic vinegar. Yep. And it doesn't matter what grade. It doesn't matter. We're going to get another strawberry. And we're just going to stick it in there. 
on the cut side and get the strawberry in the balsamic. Now, what the balsamic does, the tanginess of the vinegar works and complements with the ripening ethanols of the strawberry. So the ripening components of that fermented strawberry notes of it's growing in that, they work really well together. And what we're going to do is get some of the strawberry in the balsamic. Don't leave it in too long. You can leave it all night. You could marinate in brown sugar if you wanted and eat the strawberry and balsamic vinegar. Oh, wow. So now the balsamic vinegar has highlighted the sourness and the ferment fermentation of that strawberry. It's no longer sweet. It's quite tart, but it's really working really well. And what it's also doing is creating a bit of an umami effect because your mouth is now just salivating. How wonderful is that? That's pretty amazing, actually. I'm gonna have Strawberries one. and balsamic vinegar are a perfect pair, um, just like cream and, and um, strawberries. But balsamic vinegar, because it works on that, why don't we let, uh, make a strawberry and balsamic jam? Not only could we use it for sweet, but we could do a nice pulled brisket sandwich with a strawberry and balsamic jam on top. And it will give this really lovely compliment to the beef, that umami factor, and cut through some of the fattiness of the beef and a strawberry balsamic jam. So I'm thinking that's probably the best way to go. How do, how do the viewers like that one? They're a bit quiet. They must be a bit uh, fascinated. They must be eating strawberries and their mouth's full of strawberries. Okay, we'll move on to the next one then because we're running low on time. I've got my next one, which is olive oil. Now, someone asked, do I need a particular grade of olive oil? Um, I don't care what you're using. Um, you could use extra virgin, which has got really grassy chlorophyll cut grass notes, uh, or you can use a really soft olive oil. Olive oil and strawberries are beautiful. The Eduardo grassy fermented Eduardo, notes. What is that, Ness? Eduardo said could be the same for pomegranate too. What was that? Oh, but with pomegranate? Mm. Yeah, oh, look, I'm just using strawberries because it's the most complex. This is where people can start using their own pairings. Um, but with olive oil, you get some malic acidity coming through or malic notes. Um, the grassy fermented notes come really strong and raw and put the strawberry and olive oil together. And it's a beautiful pairing, actually. Stra strawberry and olive oil, marinade and olive oil. I don't enjoy it as much as I liked the uh, balsamic. No, because you're getting grassy notes. Pardon me, I shouldn't eat at the same time. But what's happening is you're getting those really malic acid notes coming through. But what happens is you're not tasting the strength of the olive oil anymore. No. Because the strawberry has now dominated that whole thing. It's working with the ethanols and the polyphenols and everything else that's in there. It's working really well. Now, strawberries and olive oil, I thought, you know, make a strawberry and olive oil ice cream. Olive oil ice cream, lots of people do it. But adding the strawberry in there is just going to cut the... That, that harshness or the, the tartness or the, chlor the grassy notes of the olive oil and give you that really unique savoury combination. So we're going to go on to, while we're in, um, in that territory, I've got black pepper. Now, I've, uh, yeah. I've used my black pepper. Strawberries and black pepper is amazing. I've just ground it up and I'm going to sprinkle some on, not as liberal as what I did with the um, salt. What happens is now we're doing the black pepper. The spiciness of the pepper gives a slight warmingness uh, to the strawberry. And it's a, it's also the sweet combination. It makes the strawberry juicier. So it's going to give a bit of warming and makes it juicier. So have you tried yours? I really liked that. What's that? I really like that. Yeah. So black pepper works so well with it. The yeah. strawberry is now juicy. It's really juicy. I'm not tasting the warminess of the pepper. And if you don't like pepper, put these two together and it's amazing, just that that heightened note. And I wanted to give a really random dish here. And believe me, this dish actually exists. So 
I thought, what would pair really nicely with these to get a great dish? I'm going to create a strawberry butter chicken. So strawberry butter chicken. Now, funnily enough, I say that there is actually Indian restaurants in Sydney and Melbourne that actually have a strawberry butter chicken on their menu. Oh, really? Because butter chicken uses black pepper. The strawberry works in really well. It works in with the chicken. It works with all the pairings and makes the most unbelievable butter chicken. And there's a beautiful, I, I can put it in the notes a little bit later. I forgot the name of the restaurant at the moment, but there is an Indian restaurant in Sydney that makes one of the best ones and they've won awards because of strawberry butter chicken. So the, the black pepper, getting it a little bit sweeter and, and juicier and making that butter chicken all heartier and, and that there. So a nice savory combination there. So when you say strawberry butter chicken, what do they just put the strawberries in at the end or they? No, no, it's the strawberries are pureed as part of the, the sauce. So your normal butter chicken, puree your strawberries, put that in, saute at the front with your black pepper when you use spices. So it builds that nice, Indians are the best at building dimension of flavor. So put it at the start. Uh, even uh, if Andrew Ballard's online and he wants to use some Nord products, he could put some strawberry puree through them and uh, just heighten them into a new one. He does an Indian range, which is the Patak's range. He could use strawberries at the Patak's range at the front end with the, the paste and elevate his taste sensation. It's not something you'll leave is probably going to sell, but it's something different. Now, in all the rest of the time, we're going to go to the next one. And those that are good, we made coffee beforehand. Yeah. Hopefully, it doesn't matter if it was instant. It doesn't matter if it was espresso. Hopefully, some people know their coffee and made a really good one. All I'm doing is dunking it in. Now, the coffee and strawberry, sweetness of the strawberry, what removes the bitterness of the coffee and brings out either a, a tobacco note or a marzipan almond note. So strawberry, coffee. We know coffee's quite bitter. Actually, I'm getting tobacco notes in mine. I did too. Yeah, so nice, really smoky tobacco notes, or you're getting a marzipan kind of almond note coming through. Um, this pairing, I thought a really wintry dish is a beautiful tartar tan. You know, people should be making them, you know, get the strawberries in the pan, put some coffee, deglaze it, put your puff pastry in and make it a beautiful tartar tan. Uh, it would be really cool because you get that smoky tobacco notes. People saying fun things online. Will they be nice? Yeah, Alex had to go, so I just... Oh, said... okay. Well, I've only got um, four more to go, um, which we'll really get through. We've done, you know, the bitterness. We're going to go into sweet territory. Um, we're going to get our honey and strawberry and strawberry and honey work really well because what do strawberries do? Um, they produce a flower. The bees love the flower. Bees produce honey and strawberries and honey are a perfect combination. I just put the honey on. Now, the interesting thing is, yeah, it's not going to make it sickly sweet. You would actually um, get a really complex, fresh, sweet balance where it's a bit more fragrant and floral and actually will elevate the honey notes of whatever the bee made the honey um, from. Oh, wow. See how? Wow. So I just, uh, in all of that, I had a clover honey. So I'm getting some really nice grassy notes. That honey is really quite elevated, but the strawberry's got this really nice um, kind of a jammy consistency note coming through. It's really lovely. Um, strawberries and honey, because of that floral combination, I thought a really nice strawberry and honey muesli bar with a homemade yogurt topping on top, which really nice and healthy and quite really um, exciting to eat. Now, strawberries, because they've got some uh, different sterols in them, strawberries can also taste like cotton candy or fairy floss. So our next pairing is some cinnamon. And I've just got some ordinary powdered cinnamon cinnamon and we're going to sprinkle very lightly some strawberry and cinnamon and rub it in to the flesh of the strawberry now strawberry and cinnamon the the chemical esters that work here uh kind of represent it like it's like cotton candy or, or it kind of has that slightly spicy note um it's quite warming 
And um, I think it is very quite sweet in how it's done. So here we go. There you go. Oh, wow. I'm getting fairy floss notes. You are? Yeah. <laughs> what is that? Fairy floss. Warming. You're getting some spice notes coming at the front. It doesn't taste I, like... Uh, I didn't get fairy floss. Okay. Because the strawberry may be different, but the cinnamon and that work really well. And I think you're getting a slightly spicy note. It's kind of warming. I think the best per, um, combination here is strawberry and cinnamon croissant. So making a strawberry puree, putting it through the pastry, cinnamon, strawberry and cinnamon croissant would be warming, really lovely, warm. That sounds great. really nice. Something different. I'm just trying to think of different things. Now, we're going to do uh, a really quick pairing. This one, um, you want something a little bit more um, spicy, aromatic, but also sweet. I'm going to use some basil leaves. So you can either chop them up or if you've got whole basil leaves, wrap your strawberry in the basil leaf. These two work really well. Um, and and I'll tell you a, a great pairing in a second. So strawberry and basil. I've got some basil on top of my strawberry. The smell of the basil is beautiful. Oh my Do God, want... I love that. How beautiful is that? A beautiful pairing. Imagine that in a salad, like a yep. basil and strawberry salad. So what I suggested was a tomato and strawberry salad with basil mozzarella and just drizzle olive oil on top. So olive wow. oil, cheese, basil, tomatoes, all work with strawberries will be the most unbelievable dish people will have. Mm. Um, probably, that's probably my favourite so far. That, that was probably the best one. Actually, I lied. Um, we only had three to go. So... The last one is strawberry and chili. Yeah, I'm a bit worried about this. So I was like, I don't like a lot of chili. But rub it in. Now, the spiciness of the chili actually really stands up to the sweetness and provides one of the most unique flavor combinations. Sweet chili, warming. Uh, if you were making a pickle, you could do some chili on this. I don't like chili, but I'm going to do this one anyway. Oh, wow. It's warming and sweet. Yes. You know what it's like? You know those little crackle things that you buy? Um, they go, they pop in your mouth? Yep. You almost feel it all just like fluttering on your tongue. And, and I don't like chilli, but there's a nice warming effect down my throat. And I was a bit scared about that one, but that was quite good. The chilli I used um, is, was quite hot, actually. Um, but it's not as, it's taken away some of that heatness coming through. Um, and this one... You could do a uh, strawberry and chili chutney, really simple, and that would be a great hot dog topper. Uh, put it on top of hot dogs, or put it on your cheese board and marry with cheeses and that creaminess of cheese and chili and That'd strawberry. Be nice. Something different. Yeah. I was trying to think of su sweet, savory, balanced sort of thing is in that space. Now that was our pairing. So those at home, um, hopefully you had some fun and there was a bit of enjoyment. Now, strawberries is the most universal. You can get any ingredient, and like Eduardo said, you know, pomegranate or, you know, what happens if I use different ingredients? So the um, notes that I did for this, are you putting them up as well? I will put them up on our website, yeah. yeah so there's some notes so that everyone can understand this. Start practicing and working out some uh, ideal combinations. So strawberries, almonds and cream. Strawberries, olive oil and balsamic vinegar. We're pairing the right things together. Mussels and white wine. Uh, what about black pepper, balsamic, strawberry, or basil and tomato? Uh, pineapples, um, pineapple, salt, chili. Uh, we can keep going on and we can keep pairing with lots of different things. Chocolate, uh, all sorts of different combinations. But that really gives you a snapshot of understanding flavor. It gives you a snapshot of what, what people look at and what's out there. It's a bit of fun as well to understand that. You've got some great people on this. We've got chefs online. We've got people that make their own products. That's awesome because they're tasting their products all the time. And true people or some of the true flavors that people create on menus, you go, oh, wow. And that dish, you know, or a cookie that Nan used to make, you always remember it because those smells are attributed to it and you remember those flavors. Great pairings, as we said, can make your business 
uh, more fruitful. It can be, you can charge higher price for beautifully paired dishes. We often talk about the restaurants that we remember the most for dishes that we've had. Uh, we walk away from the restaurants that we don't remember some of the dishes or flavors that just didn't work. Um, chefs also can do this when they're doing too ambitious, too many dishes in, in a degustation, for example, and some of the flavors clash with the dishes. So, you know, you know some dishes are great and some are a bit average. But, you know, this is where we need to start getting smarter and understanding flavor. There is lots of resources out there. This is not something we don't know anything about. Um, Vanessa, there's four books that I suggested um, that people can go if they wanted to do some more reading on this or more resource, didn't I? Yeah. So did you want me to hold them up or? Sure. So Thank this you. is my most used little book, The Flavor Thethoris at uh, Nikki Sengent. Uh, she's a great flavor expert. This is one of my favorite little Bibles. Um, it's pretty much not every flavor, but what it does is break down the flavors into groups and the natural pairings that work really well. This is available in Australia. It's about $40 to buy. It's still available on Amazon, Dimmix, wherever you want, any bookstore. And um, just a really good Bible to start understanding and appreciating flavor. Totally Appreciate my favorite books as well. Yeah, beautiful book. Um, one that's one of my, my other favorites, uh, this one here, The Flavor Bible, as you can tell it's from America. Karen Page, she's an amazing author. Um, she's had, you know, she's like Grand Actress and um, uh, Heston Blumenthal work with her. Uh, Je uh, Karen writes lots of books, but The Flavor Bible is a really simple book to, to digest because I can go up and look up anything online and find the pairing. So for example, strawberry, and it will give me all the flavor pairings that actually work really well. And if they're in bold, or black, they're actually the best flavor pairing by far for people to go and to explore. Um, there is a great resource online if you want to pay for it subscription, or you can just buy their book, The Art of the Art and Science of Food Pairing. Beautiful book. It's a very technical book. Uh, if you're a chef and you're in the field and you want to get this book, Get it. Uh, Heston Blumenthal's done some stuff. It's, a, it's amazing what's in this book. But they actually have a, an online um, session, foodpairing.com, where you can pay the subscription. And you can virtually pair things like put in strawberry, and it'll give you all the natural pairings. So strawberry and parmesan cheese, for example. Strawberry, parmesan cheese, and basil. It will give you those pairings. This book is available. It's a new book. Uh, it's only been out for um, about Christmas last year. A very technical book. If you don't understand it, um, it's where you have to really start tasting things to, to appreciate it. And then my most favorite book, which is also a new book, uh, or anything by this man, and I was privileged enough a couple of weeks ago to actually go online and actually interview this man one-on-one -on -one just for my own research. Uh, Harold McGee, who's written things like On Food and Cooking, beautiful books. This is his newest book. It's called Nosedive, A Field Guide to the World Smells. This only came out a couple of weeks ago. It is one of the most fascinating books on flavor and flavor development uh, and talking about uh, nose because no one's written about the sensory perception of nose, but absolutely fascinating. And, you know, I can go on all day about organoleptical profiling of a, of a tomato or a strawberry. Uh, but hopefully everyone got something really interesting out of that. I love that. Thank you so much. It was a little bit different. Friday, Friday feel goods. It's really quite cool. Um, start appreciating. That we've been going for an hour and ten minutes. I oh. can talk a long time. You know that, Ness. No, no, but it's 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 really really interesting, Adam. And you just you just know your stuff. And I'm so appreciative to have you on here today. And to take us on this sensory journey and i think it'd be really good to come back and do another one um maybe when you can uh next yeah. week we're going to be doing these every day well this is the basic pairings we can elevate that to the next level and, and how to really create flavors um i think chefs find it hard sometimes to find inspiration of doing dishes or doing something different all that wow factor 
that gives you that unique touch. You know, you've got Graham Kruger, who uh, I've visited in Dubbo. Amazing food in a beautiful little spot there. You know, imagine having like a strawberry balsamic jam that goes on your beef brisket sandwich or whatever it is. It's just a talk fest for your customers. It's something different. It's a point of difference. But you now can upsell and train your staff and talk about there's a story that connection between the customer and the the wait staff or front of the house staff and this is what mixologists do in the bar they mix in beautiful um alcohols or you know bitters and sweets and sours and create really great amazing cocktails uh, mixologists are probably the first really in there and chefs in the background but a mixologist you know they play with things and you know who hasn't had a you know a cosmopolitan or a you know an espresso martini it's just amazing because those flavors work well. You've got a good team member, you know, do your, your, thing, your team. As I said, get your, your, um, your stewards or your kitchen hands to train as well so they know to pick out the vegetables. Or when the, you know, the fruit and vegetables are coming in, pick them out and talk to your suppliers. Talk to people like Julio about what good fruit and veggies and what is, yeah, Julio doesn't like seasons, but what season is it best to be eaten when is it you know if it's summer great i'm going to buy them in summer and i'm going to put strawberry on my menu as a strawberry festival for example so it's a point of difference yeah no i think it's um i love it so so much fun and anyone can reach out to me and uh, ask questions i'm happy to to answer any questions or flavor combinations or anything on this session today um yeah and I think it's worth mentioning as well, next week we have the beer masterclass if anyone's interested in joining us um, for that. And there is going to be a beer and food matching in that uh, session as well, which will be really interesting. And, yeah, and everyone just, needs uh, to buy beer. by full Monday, don't they? Yeah, everyone needs to buy. Be, uh, we've got to have it by Monday because we're, um, we need to post the beers out to those that want to attend. So you're actually telling me there's a beer masterclass so I can get beer at home and we're going to sit around and talk about beer. And we're going to do trivia. There'll be a whole lot of fun in this session. But if you are interested, you can find the details on the Food Logic Facebook page um, and you can purchase your tickets through the Eventbrite link on there. And that's from the Sausage Queen, isn't it? It is, yeah. So it's... Um, it, it's going to be Chrissy and Mel Martian. Oh, right. So Chrissy Flanagan and Melissa Martian. And um, they're just funny, quirky, really entertaining. It's going to be a lot of fun. It's and an Chrissy's, and she, even though she's a sausage queen, she's a beer maker by trade. She's, she's a brewer and they also own their own restaurants. So um, really interesting, really interesting people and, and what, they're, what they're doing. And So I go to Food Logic, look it up online. Book before Monday and I'll get my beers before Friday session. Yeah. Fantastic. And it's not just in New South Wales. We've actually opened it up to anybody um, within us, within probably outside of Perth and, and perhaps Northern Territory. We may struggle to get it there by Friday, but everyone else uh, so can't see it being too big. You're saying people. I could have a beer and learn some stuff with people like Graham Kruger, Julio and Eduardo all at once. Yeah. Absolutely. That's what we need right now in COVID. Let's go do that. I think so as well. A few laughs, a bit of fun. But anyway, thank you so much, Ad. It's been wonderful. Loved, Loved every it. minute of it. Hope everyone else enjoyed it. And uh, Paul McDonald's coming up on Monday. Oh, fantastic. I'm going to have to yep. watch that one. He's, Monday, he's a lot of fun. PM. So, Is he going to make some music? I don't know what he's going to do. I'm oh, just okay. I'm going to have to tune, tune, tune in. Yeah, he won't be lost for what to do. All right. See you, everyone. Have a great weekend, everybody.